Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. Uh, I think we finally made it to our last systems design concepts video, which is freaking awesome because I've really been looking forward to getting to the next round of videos, which is going to be all the interview questions. It's kind of the main reason that I wanted to redo everything is because I just rambled a bunch in those and never really drew anything out because I was lazy. So uh, yeah, I'm going to get to those. But unfortunately, today I am super hungover and uh, there's a decent shot I just throw up while recording this. Uh, so as a result, I'm going to try and get through it as quickly as possible. So let's go ahead and get to the iPad. Alrighty guys, so today we're going to be talking about monoliths versus microservices. And I'm going to begin by talking about the monolith. And I have this handy little note here, because I know many of you might just think about my junk when I say the word monolith, but no, that's not in fact what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is effectively the idea of having one kind of you know, massive binary that incorporates all of the functionality of your application and basically as a result of having just pretty much one piece of code that's going to run everything, it basically means that you're going to deploy it together, you're going to scale it together, etc, etc, etc. So if we were, you know, to use Instagram as an example, you know, we might have literally just one binary and within that we would have the ability to upload files to our service, we'd have the ability to follow other users, uh, you know, basically serve people ads, connect to third parties, deal with metrics, and so, of course, there are going to be some pros and cons when designing an application this way. Uh, the main pros is probably just going to be simplicity. If you just have one repository, uh, you can keep all of your dependencies in check. And this is probably less relevant for something like a systems design interview, but it is an objective upside of something like a monorepo or a monolith in general. Um, and then additionally, of course, you know, if you just have a smaller application, you don't need a build for that type of scale. Why would you split everything out into different services? You're going to have a lot less to keep track of if you just have, you know, one thing that you're managing and one thing that actually needs to be kept working. So, of course, there are going to be cons with this approach as well, which is the reason that people have begun using microservices, at least in applications that require tons of scaling. So one is that uh, in the case that everything is in the same repository, one bug can really just take everything down. You know, you screw up a dependency chain and all of a sudden everything is screwed up and you've got a sev2 on your hands. The other is that you basically can't scale things out independently. So what if, for whatever reason, people were uploading photos a million times more than they were following one another? In the case of Instagram, that may actually be true. You would probably want a lot more servers devoted to exclusively uploading things than you would following things. But in the current monolith state, basically every single binary that you deploy has the ability to do both and you know you just don't really need that. So let's now go ahead and talk about microservices because this is going to allow us to be more efficient with our resources when we have an application at huge scale. So uh, in this case, you know, perhaps I'm talking about your private parts, micro, but Let's go ahead and talk about them. So in the case of Instagram, I've kind of broken it down into those five different services, you know, whatever you want to call them, theoretically. And basically the gist is, you know, if certain things are going to require more load than others, you could basically go and devote more nodes in your distributed cluster to actually running that service specifically. The issue with the monolith is, yeah, in theory, you can have just a ton of deployments of that monolith, but at the end of the day, all of those services are going to be stealing resources from what you actually want to be devoting that particular deployment to. And as a result, decoupling these things within microservices might make life a little bit easier. So the first thing is that it doesn't have to be the case that they're separate repositories, but if they are developed in separate repositories, microservices will allow you to avoid basically like global bugs. And additionally, teams can kind of develop independently from one another without any considerations into, you know, like, hey, we have to use this dependency or we have to use this technology. You're basically decoupled and you can just agree on one common interface. Uh, with which you know to have your microservices connect basically just creating API's that's what they're for um, and of course like I mentioned each service can actually scale independently which can be more cost efficient and ultimately allow you to basically get more usage out of your servers which is pretty important when you have tons of users on the con side though every single piece can fail because now we have to keep track of a bunch more stuff you know, for example, our ad service can just have a bug, it can go down entirely, and now all of a sudden we have to monitor, you know, five different services instead of one and be like, hey, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? And then, of course, when we have to deploy all of these different services to different places and all of those uh, microservices need different dependencies and different resources, that can get complicated. So to close out this video, I'm going to talk about two different types of technologies that are going to greatly help us out with microservices and actually dealing with the complications that they introduce. The first is going to be Docker. So if you haven't seen it before, the logo looks like a little bit of a whale. But basically, the gist of Docker is this. 
every single one of our microservices, assuming they have different technologies, is going to have unique requirements. You know, maybe one of them is in Python, maybe one of them is in Java, maybe even within Python, they just have different dependencies that they want. And the gist is, if I were to just deploy that to like an actual server computer, then I would have to jump to that server, download all the dependencies, and that's really complicated, and I would have to do it for every single one of them. Instead, what Docker does is it basically allows us to standardize how we are going to install those dependencies and get our development environment going. And the way that it does this is through this usage of a container. So think of a container as this interface, right? And the reason I've drawn this out as a square is because let's imagine every single computer knows how to run the square nice and easily. But then within the square, you know, you can have anything going on. You might have all different types of dependencies in here. You might have different operating systems even, like different versions of Linux that you're actually running your program on. And so Docker basically abstracts away from the actual hosts that the container is running on. Uh, the dependencies and just allows it to run the container and so you don't have to go and install the dependencies manually on each host which saves a ton of time. Additionally another really nice thing about containers is that as opposed to something like a virtual machine you don't necessarily have to like specify how many resources you need in advance you know how much memory how much CPU usage anything like that they can actually just scale up and down as more resources are needed and so of course in a world where we want to cut as many costs as possible when running our applications containers are hugely useful this is going to be critical when you've got many of them on the same host which is very common when you are using something like microservices that being said, great, now we have all these Docker containers, but what happens if uh, we need to choose, you know, for a new Docker container, which host to actually put it on? Additionally, what happens if a given Docker container crashes or stops running or a host goes down? How can we make sure that all of our programs are running as expected? This is where something called Kubernetes comes in. So I think a lot of people, when they hear about Docker and Kubernetes, think that they're actually the same thing or, you know, there's something that you use one or you use the other, but in reality, you actually tend to use them in conjunction with one another. So Kubernetes is pretty simple. We have all these containers, and like I mentioned, we don't know where to actually put them. You know, not all of this is commodity hardware, so we don't really care which host it's going on. And additionally, we want something to actually manage failures for us, because otherwise we have to monitor everything ourselves, and that can be really tough. And I had the eraser out there like an idiot. So basically, what Kubernetes allows us to do is specify this concept of a desired state. And Kubernetes, via the control plane over here, and etcd, which is basically a version of Raft, right? This is a distributed consensus uh, coordination service. I don't think it actually uses Raft under the hood. It probably uses its own algorithm. But uh, the point is, it's like ZooKeeper is keeping track of basically what systems are up, what systems are down, and as a result, it can then send that information over to the kubelet on every single host, host one, it could be a VM or it could be a physical host, host two, and then basically kubelets uh, will go spin up all of these pods, and each of these pods is effectively just running a Docker container. If a pod goes down, the kubelet can notice it and restart it, and similarly, if a host goes down, the control plane can notice it and put that stuff over on a different host. And so by doing this, Kubernetes makes things a lot easier to run and manage. So guys, let's go ahead and quickly conclude because we've gone through all of these great systems design concepts and I would just love to be able to wrap it up so I can go throw up. First off, basically the gist is if you're a massive company, if you're a Google, if you're a Facebook or a Microsoft or anything like that, microservices are basically inevitable. You can't really develop every single thing in the same large binary. It's going to take A forever to compile, forever to deploy, and it's going to be impossible to scale independently with different pieces. That being said, because microservices introduce all of this additional complexity when it comes to actually keeping track of and managing your services, Docker and Kubernetes, or at least tools similar to those, become very, very important. Docker, like I mentioned, is known as a containerization tool, and Kubernetes is going to be more of like an orchestration framework at least as far as I'm aware. Correct me if I'm wrong. And so, to finish off this series, I would love to give two quotes, and then we will go ahead and talk about how they're relevant here. The first is a serious one, and a very good one, which is that premature optimization is the root of all evil, as I spell optimization wrong. Bad. That's by Donald Knuth, he's a genius, and uh, is right about that. If you don't really need microservices, you don't have to actually go and build them out. Sometimes a monolith is going to make your life easier. If you're just building for a personal project and you anticipate you're gonna have 100 users most, you probably don't need a bunch of disjoint services. Just write it all on the same app. And of course, for my ex-girlfriend, yours is perfect, the big ones hurt anyways. Sometimes you don't always wanna design for scale if you don't need it, and uh, this was a convoluted way of me trying to make a joke about it. But generally, guys, 
What I want to say most is thank you all for watching this series. I hope it's been helpful. I continue to get really, really great feedback from all of you, and more importantly, you guys continue to tell me that it's really benefiting you. Tons of you have gotten job offers, and I plan on making an appreciation post for all of you at some point that I can keep track of. Anyways, guys, have a great rest of your weekend, and I'll see you in the next one.